your Bibles with me. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke this morning. The Gospel of Luke chapter 2 is where we'll be taking our text from. Luke chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 1 through 20 here in just a few moments. Luke chapter 20, verses 1 through 20 this will be our text this morning. The title of this morning's question, uh, this morning's message is this question, Will Christmas find you distracted or devoted? Will Christmas find you distracted or devoted? You know, the Christmas season is one of the busiest, if not the busiest times of the year for most people. They have been preparing for months, and as soon as Thanksgiving is over, we begin the Christmas celebrations, and they last for weeks. While I enjoy gathering with my family and friends, I wonder if Christmas has not become too busy. I saw on Facebook Tuesday night where someone said, Five Christmas get-togethers down, four more to go. I believe that post could be true for most of us. We're running here, we're running there, we're gathering here and gathering there. Hustle and bustle. It's easy to become so busy and distracted that we fail to celebrate the real reason for Christmas. Our gift-centered society will have little or no consideration for the birth of Jesus Christ. In our text this morning, we read what Christmas is really about, which is the birth of Christ. But we also find in our text this morning that people were either in one or two conditions on the first Christmas morning. We find that some were distracted and some were devoted. As we walk through this text this morning, I'm going to challenge you to honestly evaluate yourself and see which one you would be this morning. Are you distracted by the hustle and the bustle and the gift giving and the gathering? Or are you devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ and the reason why He came? Let's read Luke chapter 2 this morning, verses 1 through 20, then we'll have prayer together. That's what the Bible says beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his spouse wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. And it came to pass, and the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, and it was told unto them. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your divine, inspired, and errant word. Lord, we ask you to bless the reading of it, and we ask you to bless the preaching of it. Lord, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll be able to communicate today. We pray, Father, there be... Uh, a power today to uh, seal our minds, to refocus us. As we've been busy hustling and bustling, Lord, help us now to evaluate our own lives to see if we're distracted or devoted this Christmas season. 
Lord, we ask you to have your way in us and through us today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And amen. amen. There's two types of people, as I've mentioned, found on the first Christmas morning. First of all, we find here that there were some distracted that first Christmas. Some were distracted that first Christmas. Now, when Jesus was born, Bethlehem was filled with visitors, but they didn't even notice that the Son of God had come to earth. While you and I may be familiar with the real reason for Christmas, we too can become too distracted and we can fail to worship the Lord Jesus Christ during this Christmas season. Let's consider what caused these people to be distracted. We'll know three reasons this morning for their distractions. First of all, we find here that the people were burdened. The people were burdened. Notice verses 1 and 2 again. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. Now Rome required that every 14 years there be a census for military sake as well as for information sake. <coughs> we find here that every Jewish male was required to go back to his birthplace where he was from and to participate in this census so they could record his name, his occupation, his property, and his family. Now, traveling in that day was very difficult. They didn't hop in a car. They didn't get in a plane. They had to uh, walk or travel by some type of riding some animal. And so it was a burden for the average family to make that trip. It was difficult. As the Sunday school lesson this morning pointed out, the trip for Mary and Joseph was approximately 90 miles. And again, you can imagine how difficult that would be. The man of the house would have to take off work for ever how many days it took to travel. And as he had to take off work, you know what that means? He didn't have any money. And so as he had to take off work to go participate in the census and he lost all that time, you can imagine that a financial burden was created. <coughs> now, you can also think about how difficult the trip was. So the people in Bethlehem weren't looking for a Messiah. They were burdened about this participation in a census. They had made many uh, long journeys. They traveled a long ways. It cost them a lot of money to make the trip. They were burdened by many things on that first Christmas. And I think that we, you and I, have to admit there's burdens in our lives that uh, cause us to be distracted from time to time. Some of you today are under a financial burden in which you put yourself in because you think you've got to have all these gifts, gadgets, and gizmos to give everybody. And this morning you are burdened by the financial strain you have placed on you and your family and your focus is nowhere near on Jesus because you're in a financial bind this morning. You see... People uh, don't change. No matter how long time passes, people are still people. And some of you this morning here, you're burdened. Either you're about to travel somewhere or you've already traveled somewhere. You're burdened by the Christmas season. I've got to travel here. I've got to travel there. It's going to cost this. It's going to cost that. And you're under a burden today and you can't really celebrate what the season is about because you put yourself under a burden. The first Christmas morning, the people were burdened. They couldn't look for a Messiah. They couldn't look for the King. They found themselves under a burden. Their lives were in turmoil. In many this Christmas season, the lives are in turmoil and they're distracted because they placed themselves under a burden. Secondly, not only were the people burdened, but the people were busy. Mm -mm -mm. This is going to get real, person. They were busy. Notice verse 3. And all went to be taxed. Everyone in his own city. So this was an option. Everybody had to participate. Everybody's making a mass exodus or a trip, if you will, to Jerusalem here, to Bethlehem. They're all headed that way. And as all these Jewish people are traveling back to the city of their fathers, they weren't thinking about the things of God. They weren't looking for the birth of Christ. They were busy dealing with the things necessary to make the trip. They were worried about, hey, i got to have my paperwork in order to file this census. They were too busy to recognize that one of the most important events in history were taking place. They were too busy. Now, being busy or being productive isn't sinful until it gets in the way of the Lord. I knew I wouldn't get into that. <laughs> 
There's nothing wrong with being busy or being productive until it comes between you and the Lord. And then it's a sin. It's wrong then. Amen? 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 Amen. 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 It's wrong. When things become between you and God, that is idolatry. That is your God. Whatever you put before God is your idol. That is what you're worshiping. That's what you're serving. And so that's the way it is. And during this time of year, there's lots of places to go. And the focus is more on buying gifts and decorating the house for the guests and having the right food and being here and being there. And we become so busy that we leave very little time to really think about Jesus and to reflect on the reason for the season. You see, here's the problem. Most people are so busy celebrating the birth of Jesus, they don't have time to talk or, or to meet with Jesus. Isn't that sad? We say we're celebrating the birth of Jesus, but we don't have time for it. Lots of people won't be in church today because they are having Christmas. Right. Mm, that, don't, that, don't, that don't add up to me. We don't have time for the Lord, but we're celebrating His birth. Something's not right there, is it? Some were distracted that first Christmas morning because they were burdened. They got themselves, or they were in a financial strain. They were burdened by the traveling. They were busy with all these things. The third reason they were distracted because they were blind. The people were blind. Verse verse 7. And she brought for her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now Joseph and Mary had made this difficult trip to Bethlehem. She would soon give birth to the Messiah, but there was no place to stay for them. Surely Joseph had some family there. Surely somebody would have allowed them to stay, and perhaps that's where they wound up. But you see, here's the thing. It appeared no one really cared that the Messiah was about to be born. Their hearts weren't focused on the coming king. They were spiritually blind, if you will. And many are distracted from the real meaning of Christmas today because they're spiritually blind. They have no idea about Jesus. They can care less about Jesus. They have no idea what Christmas is really about. Most people today think Christmas is nothing but gifts and gatherings. They don't realize that God came to man. We need to be reminded of why it is we're celebrating Christmas. And we should never be uh, guilty of being so distracted with Christmas that we forget what it's all about. Many people burdened, busy, and blind this Christmas season. Second, not only were some, we find that some were distracted the first Christmas, but we find that some were devoted that first Christmas. Some were devoted. Not everybody was distracted. There were some who give you and I some examples of the devotion we should have during this time of year. Three examples of devotion. First of all, we find an obedient couple. An obedient couple. Look at verses 4 and 5. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Now don't you think about for just a moment all that Mary and Joseph had just endured in the previous months. Alright guys, we can identify with Joseph. You just found out your fiance is pregnant with a child that's not yours. Mm. Mary finds out she's carrying the Son of God. They have to work through the issue. Joseph's fiance says, Honey, I'm carrying a child that's not yours. It's been conceived by the Holy Spirit in my womb of God. You imagine having to work through that issue. And after working through that issue, they have to make this 90 mile trek with his fiance, his, 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 his wife here that's about to give birth any moment. But you see, here's the thing I want to, my point I want to make is this. After they worked through all this, they've had all these difficulties, they didn't say, Lord, I don't like your plan for my life. They didn't say, Lord, I don't understand your plan. I'm not going to be obedient to you. Instead, we find them here instead of protesting and fussing why it is God has allowed this to happen in their lives. They just obey God. They load up and they travel right on to Bethlehem just like they're supposed to. You see, we find them here obeying God's will for their life. They choose to follow the Lord and to live for Him instead of doing what they want to do. 
They're not following their own desires, their own wishes and wants. Mary and Joseph were committed to the Lord. Listen, I'm going to tell you from a man's perspective, Joseph had to be committed. Amen? <coughs> My fiance come in and told me she was expecting a child with man. See ya. <laughs> She'd be on the road. We find here that Mary and Joseph were committed to the Lord. Think about this. They had the same burdens. Joseph had to shut down the carpenter shop long enough to travel. He was under the strain of taking care of his expecting fiance wife. He's worried about getting there. Having a, he's, they're under the same burden. They're under the same business. But they don't forget who they belong to. In the midst of all that's going on, they're still obedient to the Lord. You see, they weren't blind to God's purpose for them. As we approach Christmas this week, you and I should consider Mary and Joseph's example of how we should renew our desire to want to be obedient to God's plan for our lives. We should want to be obedient to God. You see, while we're all busy right now, you and I can still make the time to be devoted to the Lord. Amen? Amen. No matter how busy we get, we can still choose to be obedient. Second, we find here not only the example of an obedient couple, we find also the example of a redeeming son. Notice verses 6 and 7. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Now the moment that God's people have been waiting for finally arrived. The Messiah was born in Bethlehem just as God had promised and all over the world and even those who should have been looking missed it. God was still faithful. Amen. Aren't you glad that God's faithful when nobody else is? Amen. And we find here there's no greater picture of devotion than the birth of the Lord Jesus. Think about this. Jesus, the Savior, chose to become a son. He willingly came to earth in the form of a man so He could provide redemption for the world. Now Jesus chose to come down to a people who weren't really looking for Him at all and they really didn't care whether He came or not. See, Jesus came for you and I. You see, He came to bear our sins on the cross so that we could have the opportunity to be saved. And that morning, uh, that whenever it was that Jesus was born, Mary began to wrap Jesus in swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes were strips cloth. She wraps her newborn baby. But you know what those strips of cloth were also used for? They were also used to wrap dead bodies and place them in the tomb in Bible times. I believe the swaddling clothes was a picture of the death that Jesus Christ would soon face. She wrapped him that morning as he was born. You see, we're reminded here that even in his birth, he was born to die. He was born to go to the cross to pay for the sins of humanity. Have you ever seen such love and devotion? Jesus, the redeeming Son, He chose to come to earth to save you and I. We find examples of devotion in an obedient couple. Mary and Joseph obeyed the will of God. We find an example of devotion in a redeeming Son. Jesus chose to leave the glory of heaven to come to earth. The third example we find here, a devotion is in a receiving few. A receiving few. Look at verses 15 through 18. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at these things which were told them by the shepherds. Now, it wasn't the Pharisees and the Sadducees that got the announcement that morning. It wasn't the uh, religious elite in Jerusalem that got the news the Messiah had come. God sent the news to shepherds. And shepherds were social outcasts. The people wanted nothing to do with them. They were primarily loners and looked down upon. 
And we find here that those who had been rejected by society, they were the first ones to receive the news the Savior had come. You see, these shepherds, they weren't too burdened, they weren't too busy, and they weren't too blind to receive the Lord and to make room for Him. Amen? The Bible says they went quickly to worship Him. Now there's a great truth here for us. We're aware that the majority of the world this week will have no room for Jesus in all their lives. Most will never even give them a thought. But here's the thing. That's exactly what the Bible says, isn't it? The further I go in the ministry, I say the truth of Matthew 7, 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There was a receiving few that morning. Everybody else was too busy, too burdened, and too blind to know the Son of God came. But this, these, these group of shepherds, these few, were willing to receive the Lord, to worship the Lord, to go and to meet Him. And we find here, they were the receiving few. And I'm glad to say this morning that I'm one of the receiving few. That I have received the Lord Jesus Christ and I know who He is and I know that He's mine. I don't know about you this morning, but there will be millions who will not even consider the Lord Jesus this Christmas, but that's no reason for us to leave Him out. Everybody else may overlook Him, but we and I shouldn't overlook Him. I've received the gift of His glorious salvation and the promise of eternal life. And I want to make this a season of devotion for my love for the Lord Jesus to get distracted in the gifts and the gatherings and the goings. I want my love for the Lord Jesus and my devotion to be hotter than it's ever been before. Amen? Amen. You see, we're going to make Christmas a time of celebration and worship for the one it really reveals. In closing this morning, I ask you, how will Christmas find you Tuesday? Is Christmas going to find you distracted? Or is Christmas going to find you devoted this year? Are you going to be distracted by the burdens and the business and get your eyes off the real reason for Christmas? If you're here this morning, you're a believer. Let me ask you specifically, are you committed to devoting yourself to the Lord Jesus this year? Maybe you need to renew that desire, renew that vigor that you have for Him. Maybe you ought to come this morning, you know, as believers, we take our salvation for granted so much. And perhaps this morning you need to come and say, Lord, thank You for the gift of salvation. Thank You for what You've done for me. You know, we... Take those things for granted, don't we? We take the people that mean the most to us for granted. We take the things that mean the most to us for granted. A couple weeks ago, the electricity was out in our house for 32 hours. Oh boy, there were no electronic gadgets in our house. <laughs> Faith said one time, she said, there ain't nothing to do. I said, go back to bed. <laughs> she went back to bed and covered up. We take those things for granted, don't we? Yes, we do. We take that we got a nice building that's warm and comfortable to come to and worship. Yes. People halfway across the world last night, our time was hidden in a dungeon somewhere trying to have church, hoping the police didn't catch them. You and I sit here today not worried about a thing. Said, well, we're going to have for lunch. We take Jesus for granted. We take our salvation for granted. We take so much for granted. Maybe you need to come this morning and say, thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. <coughs> Maybe you're here this morning, you're lost, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Maybe perhaps God's speaking to your heart this morning about coming to Jesus. I invite you to come to Jesus. I'll be standing down front here in just a moment. And I advise you to do just like the shepherds. Come quickly. The shepherds went with haste. Come to Jesus today. Don't wait. As the devil will do his best to talk to you out of coming. As we stand and sing, what number, Brother Walter? Number 162 in the blue book. As we stand and sing.